This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus at the University of California in Berkeley. I have been a member of the Church of Satan, of the Nishirendai Shonen, of the Rosicrucians, two different groups, of about six or seven black and white magical groups. I have been infiltrating and subverse I haven't been infiltrating and subverting dozens of religious and magical groups in over the past five years of my study. I set out deliberately to do it. I've gotten kicked out of every single one of them, and they've all kicked me out with exactly the same words. Shut up or get out, kid. This radio, broad <laughs> so this radio broadcast is the only organization which has not yet driven you away. What I'm saying is that I think authentic religion is not afraid of someone who asks questions. I'll watch it and I'll put it in again. I think authentic religion is not afraid of criticism. It's not afraid of heckling. It's not afraid to examine ideas because it has a faith in God, which is a powerful one and an individual one. And I will agree with you on that. Uh, but unfortunately, there seem to be very few people with that kind of authentic religion since everybody I talk to gets either angry or afraid whenever I start talking to them. Do I? I? Assaulted Do I? Times. No, but you're one of the few authentically religious people I've ever met in my life. And I have met thousands of them all claiming to be religious. But I have been in Berkeley now for three years. And I haven't been exactly the quietest person in Berkeley for three years. I've been doing a lot of screaming. And in my time in Berkeley, I've had my head clubbed by cops twice. I've had two of my ribs kicked in by radicals, and I've been attacked attacked some 12 or 13 times by Christian evangelists. I once had now, my I nose. Three groups. Which one is the most dangerous and violent? I once had my nose broken in three places, and believe me, I'll never go those places again. <laughs> yes, I'll tell you that. Yes. <laughs> what a man has to suffer for his belief. Yes. Do you believe God is your father, and you're a son of His, and uh, every person on this planet is a brother? Sure, yeah. sure. I really believe that. Um, I don't know how they how to put it in words, but I can, I mean, you know, I can just, uh, I feel it, you know, yeah. see, in this, uh, really, I, I, you know, I just can't explain it, you know, I, I got it all inside of me, you know, what I just, right now, it just won't come out. Yeah. That's what's going to change this world, I believe. Here you and I are standing on this Berkeley campus, you're a black man and I'm a white man, and yet I believe we have one Father God and we're brothers, and I believe that can change this world if people love each other that way. You think so? Yeah, I think so. Um, I wish the, all of the people felt that way, you know. Um, it would be tremendous if everybody just came in and won, you know, and, 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 and had that belief. Began living as the family of God. Right, 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 right. Um, I was watching TV. It was, uh, uh, I forget the name of the program, but it had a rock and roll group on it. Um, and uh, the subject came up like that, you know, this guy, he had uh, studied ministry. And uh, the subject came up about black people. Well, then he said, um, for black people, he said, this is the way I feel. He said, out in the open, the flowers that you have in your garden, he said, they belong to, to, uh, to God. And say, people, humor is the same way. They are flowers of God. All of them is one. And all different colors, still. Definitely, definitely. Right, right. That's great. I believe all different colors are sons and daughters of God and brothers in one family. And if people can turn to God with all their hearts and begin to live with this new love, then the world is going to be transformed. I believe that. Do you? Yeah, I believe so, too. I do, too. You're, you're saying that this God exists as, as a force or being that exists for every person, whether he recognizes it or not. And as far as I'm concerned, God doesn't exist unless a person cares to recognize it. A person could deny, I suppose, could deny the force of gravity. That's not, that's not fair. The force of gravity, you know? Like, I'm not denying the force of gravity. I'm not denying emotion, emotion, you know? I'm not denying beauty or, or, or love or... or and I want to make this a comparison. Before Newton and before the discoveries in the realms of physics, which led us to the principles by which the force of gravity worked, it would have been possible for a person to deny... No, because there, there's never, there was never the concept there to deny, you know? They were still living in a world in which the force of gravity was acting upon them. They just didn't recognize... Right. Them. This is exactly what I'm saying, that you're living in a world in which God is acting you upon you, you but you may not recognize it. Very groovy goal and I, I, I'd like to say that you can reach that goal by very many different roads. You, you have the turnpike. To take an extreme, to take an extreme semantic argument, perhaps, um, perhaps man has lived as long as as long as he is capable of living. You know, and that you're denying the real, the, you're denying the basic 
nature of man by saying that unless he finds God, he's going to destroy himself. Perhaps it is the basic nature of man to destroy himself. But I can also look to a few great souls in history who still give me hope that the planet doesn't have to be this way, that we, if we'd start living by spiritual values and seeking spiritual truth, that things could change. And I refuse to give up that ideal, that conviction. On everybody's side. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because he's the father of the yeah, whole planet. Yeah, like you see, if we're political, poli politically opposed forces, man, you have your religious uh, uh, advisors, and, and I have my ad religious advisors, and both my, both our religious advisors assure us that God is on both our sides, so we have a holy war going. That is that is the situation today. But I don't think it has to go on. I think that a larger concept can take place. How? For one thing, by preaching it. Because until people hear it, they don't really consider it as an ideal. Well, it's a start, yes. Uh, it's a start, preaching. Okay, now here is a situation which, from a humanitarian standpoint, I don't think anyone can deny. Thousands of children die every single day as a result of political manipulations. Yet, here are all the countries, us, France, Russia, both sides of the curtain, here are all these countries that have the capacity to do something about this, all have their own religious establishments, right? Nobody can do anything. For too long, God has been the God of this particular longitude and latitude, whatever country you're living in, and not Father of all people. Okay. Jesus taught and the great religionists taught that God is Father of all men and all men are brothers. If we begin to believe this, maybe we can begin to treat each other that way. Well, but what you're saying is that, that you think that, that the political problems in the world and the, and the, and the various social problems, the problems of feeding people in India, you know, the problems of organizing the people and, and uh, you know, in communist countries, the problems of, of organization and so forth, can all be solved if everybody will, will agree to, to find within themselves uh, a life meaning in terms of your God, right? Their but motivations can be changed so they want to solve them, and many people are not even interested in solving world problems. There are still people on this planet who love to see others trodden down and enjoy doing the trotting themselves. I'm saying that at least it's a start if we can change human motivations. But do you want to change, uh, you were talking about nationalistic, you know, um, religions which are causing problems. So, but I know about Hinduism. I don't I don't know whether Hinduism uh, preaches the one God. I was Brahman, who is the one God and but, but isn't isn't Brahman also the this the God in the self. I mean which, Atman which makes, is the God in the self. Okay. There are a few basic truths which are not just ideas, but which can be experienced, this sense of being loved by God by faith. It's possible to experience communion with God in prayer. And because that's possible it can change the individual and the individual can change the world. I feel like uh, I'm one of the last people from the fl flower child generation because I was uh, around the hate when it first began. and I The hate Ashbury the district of San Francisco. And uh, it was really so beautiful when it first began and I saw a lot of the people's attitudes changing and when they started using speed and smack and things like that. and. Uh, Speed and smack, for those listening, incidentally, are methamphetamine and heroin, for those who aren't familiar with the jargon, correct? And then, right, and then, then also some of them got hardened and became revolutionary, so it's, it's pretty bad that way, too. Well, I used to be strung out on smack, and... You used to be on heroin, in other words? Yes. For how long a period of time were you on heroin? I shot it every day for a year. How much was that habit costing you? How expensive was it at that time? Well, it ran as high as fifty dollars a day, and and I have burned people, ripped them off. I have been in knife fights. Uh, I've Winning or losing? Some I won, and some I lost. <laughs> as a smile, now I could see some teeth missing. It nearly cost me my life. Uh, I got so bad into burning and ripping off that uh, people were out to kill me for it. This was during the period of time, you say, for a year while you were on heroin. Right. Continually and every day. Right, right. And then you found God, and this changed your life? Uh, I was in Mendocino Hospital for my third time, and uh, I was when I was released, the very same day I was released, I, I thought back to the other two times I was released, and I, re and I flashed on what the doctor said, what the psych said. He told me that uh, if I wanted a kick, I'd have to stay up there at least a year, and even after that time, the, they weren't sure that I'd, you know, be off of it or not. 
and uh, as soon as I as soon as I came out, I sold my bus ticket. They gave me a bus ticket to go to San Francisco, and I had some money. And I was thinking of going back into the city my third time and, and fixing that same day I got out of the hospital, which I had done the previous two times I was released. Taking a shot of heroin the very first time. Right, same day I got out of the hospital, and I knew I was going to do it. And I stood on a highway, and, and I st and I, then I start started doing some soul searching. Because I've had it, I've had it enough. You know, I had it up as far as I can take it. You probably almost felt as if you were searching for your soul, didn't you, <laughs> in doing the soul searching that you did at that point? Yeah, I was searching for something to rescue me from from all of this. Uh, everywhere I turn, like I've even tried to uh, take acid to get away from heroin, and take speed to get away from heroin. And I met a, a chick, and uh, I went out with her for a while, and we were making it together, but I, it didn't work. Then how was it that you found God as a personal experience in your life after all this drug taking and all this trouble you'd had? Uh -huh. All strung out on dope, th thinking all these lowly, dirty thoughts about ripping people off and burning them. Uh -huh. And I, and I, and it was a comforting thought to know that I don't have to straighten out to come to God, but He can take me just as I am and come into my life. Exactly as you were, and at the time you were thinking this and praying this, you were on heroin. And, and I, well, you know, I used to think, well, in order to meet God, I'd have to uh, clean up first, uh -huh. and I'd have to uh, get my head straight and, <clears throat> and get all these th th thoughts out of my head and all. Uh, about ripping off and burning and perch snatching and whatever, <laughs> yeah. but it's not true. He, he, it's just all. He don't care what's in your head. God doesn't care what's in your mind. He doesn't care what you look like. He sees you inside. He, he, he wants to know if you're searching. If you want the truth. If you want to change your way of life. If you want to come to the truth and to the light. That's what he's interested in. He's interested in this questing and hungering of your heart, whether you're hungry for God. That's right. You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet, Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion. How might a person define God, and to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age? The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, and Seven Principles of Prayer. Any or all of this literature, yours free, simply writing to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address. It's Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day. <laughs>